Hello and welcome to Jay Coletti's Racket Reviews. My name is Jay Coletti and I will be your hostess. Here on Racket Reviews we are dedicated to learning about all things organized crime and today I'm really looking forward to spotlighting perhaps the most powerful mobster in Tampa, Florida and that's Santo Traficante Jr. Had it not been for the Cuban Revolution, it's very possible that Traficante Jr. would have been the most powerful mob boss of all time. I can't wait to have this discussion with you. If you're enjoying the channel and would like to become a Racket Reviews patron, please head on over to the Patreon account and join the Coletti family. Now, without further ado, we have much to discuss, so let's get right to it. Luigi Santo Traficante Jr. was born on November 15, 1914, to Santo Traficante Sr. and Maria Cacciatore Traficante. Santo Jr. was the couple's second of five boys. Frank Traficante was born in 1910, Salvatore Traficante was born in 1916, specifically on November 14, 1916, which probably meant that Santo Jr. shared a lot of birthday parties with his little brother, who went by Sam. Epifano Traficante was born in 1919, and Enrico Traficante was born in 1924. All of the Traficante boys were native-born United States citizens, but Santo Sr. would not become a naturalized citizen until 1925, the year after the birth of his last son. Traficante Sr. was already a powerful Tampa Mafia kingpin by the time he and Maria started having children, and all of the Traficante boys were raised in that environment and helped the family in their business. Besides Santo Jr., Enrico would rank the highest of the brothers in the Mafia family. Santo Sr. was responsible for establishing the Traficante family in the first place. He was an illiterate Sicilian immigrant who made a fortune and legacy for his family. This cunning, Prohibition-era mobster had big plans for his sons, and they all fell in line with their father's business ventures, specifically the second son who, appropriately, was the one who shared his name. During the Great Depression, the Traficante brothers enjoyed the rare phenomenon of wealth while everybody else seemed to be losing everything. While most families were moving out of their homes into the slums, the Traficantes were moving from the crowded Latin section of the city into a two-story home in a nice neighborhood. Santo Sr. had worked hard to provide for his family, specifically in the business of gambling, and even more specifically with the Bolita Rackets. This numbers game was the biggest gambling racket at the time. In the family's garage, and in the garages of several homes throughout this neighborhood, it has been said that slot machines were stored next to lawnmowers. It is growing up in this environment that we understand how Santo Traficante Jr. was able to wrap his mind around the gambling business. While the Tampa Mafia would make tons of money from the gambling business, they would not be able to usurp the Bolita King, Charlie Wall, until the Prohibition era. Traficante Jr. would drop out of school before the 10th grade during Prohibition to focus on the family's businesses. He knew what he wanted to pursue. And I doubt that any of the electives at his high school included classes such as how to run a gambling operation, how to establish international drug trade, or how to get away with murder. The young Traficante Jr. worked closely with his father in the gambling rackets, and was likely a rum runner as well, given his intimate knowledge of the trade routes during Prohibition, which also acted as and enhanced the routes for the international drug trade. We know of at least one instance when Santo Sr. was in Cuba to get his hands on the country's rum. Since Traficante Jr. would go on to be so critical for Cuban development, I believe it is also fair to assume that both Santo Traficantes spent time, perhaps together, on that controversial little island. Traficante Jr. would continue his work with his father, and as well as getting to know the family allies, would get to know their enemies, both internally and externally. When Santo Traficante Sr. became the family head, after the murder of the founding boss, Ignacio Antonori, there was so much resistance from the faction within the family who would have preferred to see the underboss, Salvatore Italiano, take the lead, that it's a debate to this day whether or not Traficante Sr. really took over at this point. See the previous video spotlighting Santo Traficante Sr. if you would like more information on the family's internal warfare. Traficante Jr. worked with his father through Prohibition and the Depression. In 1938, he would marry Tampa native Josephine Marchese. Josephine, now Traficante, unlike many mob wives, didn't seem to miss much of the action. She hopped all over the state with her husband, and she would even travel with him to Havana later on. Because of Traficante Sr.'s close connection with mobsters such as Lucky Luciano, Frank Costello, Meyer Lansky, and Thomas Lucchese, the Traficante family worked with the New York crime families, not against, in spite of, or indifferent toward them. This led to further prosperity and an even more robust illegal trade route stretching from Buenos Aires into the U.S., through Miami, and then throughout the rest of the country. By 1940, the Tampa family, now under the control of Santo Traficante Sr., by most accounts, was able to push Charlie Wall out of the city. In exchange for his departure, Traficante Sr. promised Wall's protection. Many attempts had been made on Wall's life at this point, and this offer from Santo Sr. seemed like a safe way to cash out of the Tampa Rackets. Santo Sr. kept his word, but Wall tested the limits of this protection. Throughout the 1940s, it is reported that Wall, 
likely bitter after losing control of his city, would become an FBI informant. Keep that in mind for later. During the 1940s, Traficante Jr. was sent to New York to train under Tommy Lucchese. I just have to interject here to say that the idea of an official mafia apprenticeship sounds really cool. And making this into a type of movie, if any producers are listening out there, a Professor X of mafia activity, I would pay to see it. In his training, Traficante Jr.'s abilities were honed, and he was taught the finer points of a connected international crime ring. This training lasted around four to five years before Traficante returned to Tampa. He got back to work in Florida, and it is reported that in September of 1945, in Tampa, he and his father met with Bureau of Narcotics head George White, allegedly to make a deal with the federal government to permit the international drug routes their family had established. We cannot confirm exactly what was said during this meeting, but what we can confirm is that for the most part, these drug trade routes were left alone, and they're still in operation today. Once Traficante Jr. had returned from New York, he was officially given the status of underboss, and the family's responsibilities were slowly being passed over to him. This did not sit well with the Italiano faction of the family. It led to further bloodshed throughout the city in addition to the issues with Charlie Wall's mafia that had started the city's era of blood. In 1945, Traficante Jr. was sent to Cuba to begin investing political capital into Fulgencio Batista and dedicate funds to control the operation of the island's various clubs and casinos. Although the Traficantes were first, every mobster in the United States began to see the vision of Cuba, specifically Havana, as a gambler's haven and descended upon the island. This included Meyer Lansky, with whom the Traficantes had an amicable relationship, and Albert Anastasia, with whom they would soon have a bitter rivalry. The threat of Charlie Wall had been neutralized since 1940, or so the Traficante family thought. In December of 1950, the Kefauver Senate Committee hearings came roaring into Tampa, calling for the testimonies of just about any mobster they could scrounge up. Since many mobsters were from Sicily, they did a good job of keeping their mouths shut. Santo Traficante Jr. and his father did one better and left the city altogether to avoid being forced to testify. One man who was not afraid to sing was Charlie Wall. Wall gave the committee everything he could. He would rat out as much of the Traficante operations as possible. In fact, it's because of his testimony that we can piece together so much of this family's history. The Traficantes got away by leaving the city, but because of Wall's cooperation, he was let off the hook for all of his criminal involvement. And to make it even harder, he was also let off the hook with the Traficantes because Santos Sr. was a man of his word and had guaranteed his protection. It was after the Kefauver hearings that we see the majority of the Traficante power being passed to Traficante Jr. Santos Sr. was in poor health and fading quickly. In addition to that, the pressure was increasing on the aging mobster. His era was coming to a close, and he had a bright, well-trained protege to take the helm. Traficante Sr. left on his own terms and was semi-retired by 1950. It is widely believed that he was diagnosed with stomach cancer at or around this time. In his remaining years, Traficante Sr. passed his hard-won wisdom to his son, got his affairs in order, and spent time with his family. On January 3rd, 1953, an attempt was made on Traficante Jr. While he was seated in his sedan, another sedan drove by and fired into the vehicle before driving away. The attackers did not realize that they had missed their target and only left Traficante Jr. with a flesh wound on his arm. Traficante would later tell the state attorney, I don't have an enemy in the world. I think it was a case of mistaken identity. This was obviously a lie. Traficante had so many enemies that it's hard to tell whether or not this attack came from inside or outside the family. We do know that several men in the Italiano faction of the Traficante family took a train up north to get the support of New York and stop Traficante Jr. from taking control shortly after the attack but these men were never heard from again. I would say that they sought the support of Albert Anastasia and his men, as Anastasia was a known Traficante rival, and many of the other Mafia leaders really liked Traficante Jr. and his legendary father. By 1953, Traficante Jr. had cleaned house and neutralized the majority of threats coming from inside the family ranks. Outside the ranks, the family still had to contend with the fallout of Wall's testimony. Everyone in the Traficante family wanted Wall dead, but he still rested beneath the promise of Santo Sr.'s protection. And although semi-retired and dying of stomach cancer, Traficante Sr. was still the official boss. Wall's protection expired alongside the family's dawn. Santo Traficante Sr. would succumb to his illness and pass away on August 11, 1954. I wonder if Charlie Wall knew then that his fate was sealed. After Traficante Sr. passed away, Traficante Jr. was boss. The year after Santo Sr.'s death, Charlie Wall, who was believed to have been retired from racketeering after his testimony at the Kefauver hearings, would be murdered by having his throat slit in his home on April 18, 1955, with a printout of his testimony placed beside his body. The message was clear. Traficante Jr. was not going to necessarily keep the personal promises made by his father, 
and he would not hesitate to use violence. Although Traficante Jr. shouldered his father's legacy and led the family into the next era from the groundwork built by his father, he was his own man. For starters, he was much more public than his father. Traficante could be spotted in the best restaurants ordering the best martinis and spiciest foods available. His suits and hats were tailored for him, and he made sure everyone knew he wasn't afraid of getting violent. On the flip side, he was described as family-oriented and very soft-hearted and kind to his loved ones. Despite his public presence, he talked very little to the press. He has been described as reserved. He was also somewhat naive, it would seem. According to Frank Regano, Traficante's longtime legal representative and friend, Traficante wanted to buy a new car from a salesman in Miami, and he convinced him that he could get it for half price if he paid in cash. Traficante pulled out his famous wad of $100 bills and handed the money over. Then the salesman took off and was never seen again, and Traficante Jr. didn't even get his car. The year that Traficante Jr. became boss, a bit of that naivete was on display with police sergeant Henry Dietrich, who met Traficante outside the Llamas Club. He was undercover, pretending to be an officer interested in being bribed. Dietrich said he was nervous because the recorder wrapped under his arm could be heard humming. Traficante and his brother didn't seem to notice the noise and took the officer with them. As they drove, Traficante said to Dietrich, just remember Dietrich, keep conning the government. And if there's anything you need, we're a big family. Boom, that was all the Justice Department needed to slap a bribery charge on Traficante and his brother. Traficante Jr. was arrested on May 19, 1954. Circuit Court Judge Victor Well gave the following description of the Traficante brothers at their sentencing. A couple of rats who crept out of the sewer to contaminate our county. Harsh words from this judge. Fortunately for the Traficantes, he was defeated in the next election. Traficante's conviction would be overturned by the Florida Supreme Court, and he would be acquitted at the second trial. As boss of the Traficante family, Santo Jr. was focused primarily on two things, expanding gambling into Cuba and improving the drug trade. There were several opportunities on both fronts, especially since he was more than willing to team up with other Mafia families, specifically the New York families, the Chicago Outfit, in particular Sam Giancana, the outfit's Las Vegas liaison, and Carlos Marcello of New Orleans. With Meyer Lansky from New York, Santo Traficante Jr. took Cuba by storm. He was already close with the Cuban president Batista, and he was making more money than he really even knew what to do with. A problem I bet we all wish we had a little bit more of. Cuba was the obvious next step for anyone in organized crime. It was just a little over three and a half hours away from Florida by plane, Havana, Cuba had all the makings of the future gambling capital of the world, all of the Americans' money, without any of those pesky American laws. Lansky entrusted his Cuban investments with Traficante Jr., and as the protector and owner of several of the Havana clubs, Traficante proved himself to be trustworthy indeed. The Mafia was all in for Havana, and Santo Traficante Jr. was the representative for nearly all of them. Before we get too far into our discussion about Cuba, though, I would like to touch on a couple more things in Traficante Jr.'s life. First and foremost, his involvement in the growth of the drug trade. In addition to maintaining and improving the South American drug routes first created by his father, Santo Jr. expanded into Southeast Asia. Some of the world's largest and best heroin kingpins were from Southeast Asia, and as he was with Cuba, Traficante Jr. was the Mafia's liaison to the Orient. According to the Justice Department, Traficante directly or indirectly exerts control over a number of drug trafficking organizations by either directing or financing their operations. Those organizations are associated with all facets of drug trafficking, heroin, cocaine, marijuana. Back stateside, he was all over Florida with the drug trade and would work closely with Carlos Marcello to see their business ventures move further and further west. Traficante Jr. would continue to spend time in New York City, his alma mater as it were, but not everyone in New York City was a fan of Traficante Jr. He continued to have issues with Albert Anastasia and interestingly, checked out of a New York hotel just one hour after Anastasia was shot dead in that infamous barbershop chair on October 25th, 1957. I'm not saying he's responsible, but boy is it suspicious, and he certainly had the motive to take Anastasia out. The next month, Traficante Jr. would be arrested in the Mafia Summit in Appalachian, New York on November 14th, 1957. The fact that Traficante Jr. was at this meeting means that he played a crucial role in not only the Mafia in Tampa, Florida, but was also a decision maker regarding leadership decisions in the National Crime Syndicate. The charges for Traficante Jr. would be dropped. Now focusing back on Cuba, Traficante Jr. would enjoy tremendous success in the island nation until it all came crashing down. Although enterprising mobsters like Meyer Lansky had hedged his bets and promised money to the President Batista and the Cuban revolutionaries under Fidel Castro, Traficante had bet it all on black and did not expect a red wave to burn through Cuba. Fidel Castro, along with his brother Raul and fellow revolutionary Che Guevara, 
overthrew President Fulgencio Batista on January 1, 1959. Batista fled the country. In The Godfather Part II, the scene when Michael tells Fredo he knows he had betrayed him and sealed Fredo's fate with the kiss of death, the setting is actually at President Batista's New Year's Eve party. The chaos that ensued following that scene was probably a fairly decent representation of the chaos that took place in Cuba after Batista had abdicated his position. The revolutionaries were making a mess of the casinos and clubs, which they viewed as a corrupting American influence. Fidel Castro was very hostile toward the tourism industry and viewed everything that was considered American or having to do with President Batista as a horrible influence for his country. In the spring of 1959, Traficante, along with his associates Jake Lansky, Meyer Lansky's brother, and Dino Cellini, were arrested in Cuba. While Lansky and Cellini were released right away, their bet hedging had paid off. Traficante was known to have been close with Batista, so the Cuban officials made sure that he sold his gambling interests to them. He did, but would try for several months to regain control of his holdings. Lansky, the New York families, the outfit, New Orleans, and all of the other mobsters invested in Cuba left, but Traficante remained. Eventually, he was the last man standing. He packed his things and returned to Florida in January of 1960. The dream of Havana was over. Now filled with a desire to take out Castro, Traficante was the perfect candidate when approached by the CIA through Mafia liaison Johnny Roselli about an opportunity to get Castro out of power. Roselli, Giancana, and Traficante Jr. were responsible for multiple failed attempts on Castro's life. Traficante would later acknowledge in his testimony in the 1970s about the Kennedy assassination that he had been involved with the CIA's attempts on Castro. Because of his involvement with Johnny Roselli, Sam Giancana, and Carlos Marcello, the most common mafia names listed when discussing the JFK assassination and the conspiracy that it was the mafia who did it, Traficante is regularly linked with discussions regarding the presidential assassination, despite Traficante's avid insistence that he had nothing to do with it. It does seem a bit suspicious, though, that of the three mafia subpoenaed by the Senate Intelligence Committee about the John F. Kennedy assassination, Traficante, Giancana, and Roselli. Only Traficante survived long enough to testify. Roselli and Giancana were both murdered before they had the chance to speak. All of this media attention and coverage was proven to be frustrating for Traficante Jr. in the late 1970s. There was just too much heat, and he knew that would do him no good with law enforcement. The next decade was a quiet one for Traficante. His health was beginning to fail, and he wanted to spend time with his family, especially his grandchildren. Like his father before him, he semi-retired. In 1981, Traficante would be indicted in Miami on charges of misappropriating the laborers' union's health and welfare fund. Due to Traficante's poor health, the trial was postponed. In March of 1981, he would be indicted again for racketeering in Tampa. The Tampa trial was expected to begin at the earliest in the beginning of 1984. These trials would be postponed again, though. By 1983, Traficante's health was terrible. His kidneys were failing, and he was forced to wear a surgical mask and catheter. His heart was in horrible shape as well. Many in the Justice Department believed that Traficante was using his illness to avoid justice, while others believed that he wouldn't live long enough to begin his sentence anyway. He would be summoned to court in 1986, where he was questioned about his involvement with the Bonanno family racketeering schemes, but he was not convicted. Luigi Santo Traficante Jr. would die at the age of 72 on March 17, 1987, at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston, Texas, where he had gone in for a heart surgery. He, like his father, would be buried at the L'Unione Italiana Cemetery. When his wife Josephine died at the age of 95 in 2015, in her funeral announcement, she had requested that in lieu of flowers, donations be made to the Italian Club of Tampa Cemetery Fund. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Racket Reviews discussing the Traficante family's most powerful mobster, Santo Traficante Jr. Without Santo Jr., the entire history of organized crime in not only the United States, but Cuba, South America, Southeast Asia, and the rest of the world would have looked vastly different. Make sure to let me know in the comment section below or on Facebook and Twitter what you think about Santo Traficante Jr. Also, don't forget to utilize the comment section and social media to let me know who or what you would like to see covered next. I always love hearing from you, and I'm always happy to investigate. Make sure to like, subscribe, and click notifications to get more Mafia content sent directly to your sub box. Ciao.